Good evening and welcome to The Face of Art, the show that brings local artists out from behind the canvas and into the light. Each week we feature local artists and discuss their passion, their journey, their challenges, and their victory. Uh, our guest this evening is Stefan Kuhn. Uh, Steph lives in Costa Rica. He's been there for 26 years. He moved from Switzerland where he was an um, economist. Steph now works full-time as an artist, creating unique, colorful paintings of neo-impressionism. Uh, he's, inspired, he's inspired by color and form of Matisse and the graffiti style of Jean-Michel Basquiat. Uh, his house, appropriately named Villa Matisse, overlooks the Pacific Ocean. Join me in welcoming Steph Kuhn. How you doing? Can you hear me all right? Hello. <laughs> oh, you might be on mute. How about now? It's okay. Hey. No. Okay. <laughs> it's Zoom. You have to have at least one glitch, right? <laughs> yes, that's true. How are things in Costa Rica? Yeah, well, it's a great pleasure to be part of this uh, uh, event, uh, Kate. Um, in Costa Rica, we have uh, at this very moment. Uh, very bad weather. It was raining since uh, two, three days, but still, for me, as I live a little bit remote on my little island, it uh, not so much has changed. Cool. Yeah, it is the, for people who don't know too much about Costa Rica, it's the, it's the rainy season. So it's, it's pretty much stormy every day or not every day? Well, uh, let's say in May, June, usually it does not really rain that much. So for the last two, three days, we have uh, a really storm and um, rains like we, have uh, like we have most in most years in October. So we are rather used to better weather. We call it the green season, uh, June, July. But still, it's, uh, it's not... Uh, I mean, I'm still in a good mood, and uh, it's a <laughs> good time also to work in my atelier, you know? Great. Hey, uh, hey, Steph, before, before we dive into your life and your work, uh, I just want to take a minute to pay homage to the artist Christo, uh, who died this past week. Uh, he and his partner, Jean-Claude, uh, were known for their large-scale environmental and sometimes controversial installations. Uh, often their work involved wrapping large landmarks, such as bridges and buildings. Um, I'm going to just screen share, and we just talk for maybe talk five minutes about um, about Christo. Can you? Oops, 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 oops. I am. There he is. Uh, so, are you, are you a Christo fan, Steph? Well, uh, um, I remember quite well um, when he did uh, uh, wrap up the uh, Berlin uh, Reichstagsgebäude, which is uh, the parliament. This, this here, right? Yeah, that's, that's the one. And it was, of course, uh, they had even to vote in the parliament whether they give him the right to do such a thing. And I think that was the really the event that made him very, very famous, you know, on, on global scale. Sure. Um, and, of, and of course, there's uh, the gates in Central Park. That was a big, at least for the U.S., that was a pretty big deal. Yeah. Um, and this is his partner here, Jean-Claude. Um, I think you were telling me earlier that she was sort of the business person in the, in the relationship, the, the uh, business relationship. You know, I, I found a, a very interesting uh, fact. They are what we call astrological twins. The two of them were born on 13th of June, 1935, the same day. So they really had a, a very strong um, uh, also artistic relationship uh, that was incredible. You know, even though uh, he was maybe more the creative part, and she was more the, the commercial part. Right. Um, I think, yeah, this was another piece I found online that was pretty intriguing from, I think, 1983. That where he wrapped, wrapped an entire island. 
on the bridge in Paris. Nice portrait of him. Um, oh, and now we're back to you. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you, Christo. <laughs> Um, so you moved to you moved to Costa Rica. Let me get out a screen share here so we can get, get to see you again. There you go. Um, so you moved to uh, Costa Rica about 26 years ago. Um, I'm just curious what led to that decision. Well, um, I don't want to be too long, but I mentioned once to you, I had, uh, I call it the very early quarter life crisis, so to say, with uh, <laughs> uh, before, I think, like with 28. I sold all my things in Switzerland and uh, made uh, um, try to become a, a global trotter, which I did for two years. First, I went to the U.S. with the intention to study arts in San Francisco, but then uh, it was a little bit uh, too complicated, so I bought a ticket uh, for one year uh, into the South Pacific Islands where I lived for one year, traveling and also visiting artists in the Marquises. I was working with a French artist for four months. And uh, later I came back to San Francisco and traveled down uh, uh, Mexico, Central America, where I met uh, my, um, let's say the mother of my four uh, daughters. And we traveled together for another eight months all through Latin America until Brazil and back to Paris, Switzerland. So that's, let's say, how uh, I, at the end, ended up uh, in Costa Rica. And how was the uh, transition into Costa Rica? I guess maybe you were already warmed up to it, having done Central America. You know... It was rather a bit uh, different. After these two years of traveling, I felt I was maybe not exactly the same guy, the same, uh, let's say, economist that uh, was uh, like doing nine to five jobs in, in Swiss uh, uh, companies. So I returned to Costa Rica because I wanted to do a bit something different in my life. Sure. So it was a bit, uh, maybe even a little bit an escape, you know? Absolutely. I'm just going to show some cool pictures from your... Mm -hmm. So this is at your home and your, where your studio is here as well. Um, there's the view I was talking about in the intro. That's, the, uh, that's Garza, Garza Beach down there, the Pacific Ocean. Exactly. Here's your studio, which is amazing. Open air, open air studio. And these, these actually, these paintings here uh, lead into actually some of my my favorite works of yours. Um, the Bella Mourgier. How do you say that? Well, it's a, a Spanish a Bellas Mujeres, which is oh, a wow, beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so to say. Um, and this was a whole series of, of, of Bellas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mujeres. Mm -hmm. um, which I just find be absolutely beautiful. I, I find them seductive, too. I don't know if it's the big eyes and the, and the pouty lips, but I think they're really beautiful. Thank you, uh, Kit. I think um, there comes a bit the uh, Matisse influence. I feel... Uh, Matisse is really a deep painter uh, with his colors and figures that has influenced me a lot. Sure. Um, so is, when was this series done? Or do you still work on it? Well, the first uh, part of this series was done like maybe three years ago. I started with this. And I started also to expose them and, and uh, sell them. I had them in several, even in Nosara, they were, were in, a, in a gallery. And um, they sold uh, relatively well. And, um, but I then did a new series, uh, as I mentioned before, 
I have a little bit these two souls in my uh, uh, in my person. I also I'm uh, have the other influence that uh, is a little bit more on the wild side. That is the Jean Michel Basquiat uh, influence. So I also did then a theory which is rather on the graffiti side. Would that be? I'm, I'm leading into some other work here. Would that be? Would this be a good example of that? That is uh, a little bit uh, in this direction, yes. Colors and, and figures and a little bit rather on, on I like, uh, this is part of my life, my horse, my, uh, let's say, my life here in Costa Rica. Yeah, these are, these are crazy. I can look at these forever and, and keep seeing new things. Thank you. Now, are you, are you self-taught? Say it again. Are you self-taught? I think you mentioned that you'd studied with someone, but did you did you have any art schooling, or did you did you just teach yourself to paint? Uh, I would say I'm a self-taught artist, even though I was uh, uh, one year in Italy doing mo more uh, drawings and literature in art school, and then I was these four months working with uh, Gary Gironti, this uh, a good uh, French painter in in the French Polynesian Islands. So uh, I had there my first exhibition in Papete. And, um, but I never did formally go to, let's say art school and uh, uh, academically spoken, you know? Uh, I, I find your work very playful and, and even joyful. Is this, is this the product of your inner child? Where's, where does this come from, do you think? Display. Yeah, I think so. Uh, that's what I put in my bio also, uh, that I have kept my inner child alive. I think I have this a bit, uh, this a bit uh, humorous uh, thing that I cannot take things too serious. So it is uh, this tendency to, to sometimes have a little bit some, uh, you know, uh, impertinent or a little bit naughty scenes and... Uh, I think this is part of my life and uh, personality. Sure. I mean, I, I know, I, I know people. I've been to your to your studio with other people, and it brings it brings them joy as well. It's just so much. It's so lively, and there's just so many pieces on the walls, kind of like what's behind you now. Um, and I just, you know, I just find people as soon as they get there, they got a big grin on their face, so they really share and share in that joy. Yeah. What you see right now behind on the top, this is uh, again part of a new series which I call in French Matisse et moi. It's a bit uh, again uh, back uh, to the Matisse uh, color, colors and, and uh, aesthetic that also uh, attracts me a lot. Is that, is that this piece here on my screen now? That's, that's one. Uh, one of those pieces which is uh, very much, uh, you know, uh, and that's the, uh, kind yeah, of the that's the Matisse, uh, you know, right. that is inspiring me with the, with the fishes <laughs> and all this. Looks like you borrowed some goldfish. <laughs> yeah. It's a classic, you know, uh, painting. And I also found these, these, this interesting too, that the center of this piece is the, the dancers also from Matisse. That's absolutely that true. What's yeah, that? That is, that is uh, the uh, le joie de vivre. It's like, uh, as they say in, 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 in English, it's the joy of life, uh, this painting. And then it's mixed up with uh, uh, things like uh, my, my figures, uh, the horse, the, the palm trees. So it's, it's a bit like, uh, you know, I'm there on the black uh, can on the white canvas and start the, uh, just uh, uh, as uh, my French uh, uh, painter said, uh, vide le cigare, just uh, getting down everything I have just a bit uh, uh, stored in my, in my mind, you know? Sure, sure. It's um, not so planned, you know, it just comes out. So you've talked, you talked a couple of, you talked about a couple of your influences, uh, Basquiat and Matisse, um, Paul Gauguin, yeah, Paul Goga, uh, of course, because um, where I lived in this island, I mentioned before in the Marquesas Island, 
uh, where this French painter Gary Kirongi was living and building his own home and so on. Uh, it was the place where uh, even where the burial site of Paul Goga uh, is. So I was on his uh, place. Uh, it was people not even knew about him. This was at the time I was there. Uh, it was really a, a, a very remote place. And uh, so was it was that Tahiti or near Tahiti? Because that's where he wasn't that one of the areas he went to. You know, Tahiti. He, he did several trips, but uh, Tahiti was the first uh, uh, let's say um, place he he was, and then it was he came into problems a bit with the French colony officials. So he left then for the remote Marquesas Islands. And, uh, but also there, he was all the time a bit in trouble, especially because he was helping a lot the, uh, 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 let's say, the Polynesians, you know, the indigenous uh, uh, people there against the French uh, uh, colony uh, officials. So that brought him in trouble all the time. But uh, he lived then in, in Tai Ohio, which is quite a remote uh, island, maybe two, three days on a boat, um, where I stayed with this French painter. Is that right? Yeah. And also, uh, artistic spoken, um, you know, he went uh, a bit, what we, uh, uh, what he said, uh, um, back to nature. Um, so he, tried uh, in modern art to reinvent uh, art in a way that he really wanted to go, go back to, uh, um, to, uh, to nature, you know, and uh, painted with his colors uh, all these uh, uh, nature uh, trees and, and, of course, also women. And, uh, I like that a lot, you know. Yeah, I just find it, I find the comparison kind of interesting that you you traveled to Costa Rica and painted women after <laughs> after leaving you know leaving your job in in Switzerland. You know, I mean, uh, I like uh, the aesthetics and the beauty, and I mean uh, the uh, if you see Matis, uh, he was uh, uh, also uh, I mean the women were were his. Uh, uh, preferred, uh, let's say, uh, subject. He did really paint uh, very skillful. So it is maybe really an expression of, uh, of, uh, of uh, which has a, a, a great attraction to everybody, you know? Now, are you, are you, when you paint women, are you working with live models? No, not, not really. I uh, have uh, um, sometimes photos, sometimes I also have, uh, you know, memories. But um, um, maybe that is a good idea, you know, to to, uh, to start with, you know. Hey, but are these are these actual people? Because I noticed the way they're named. I didn't know if that was the real first name or just something you, a name you gave them. Yeah, some some are actual uh, people I know. Some are um, just uh, you know uh, uh, fantasy uh, figures. Okay. <laughs> hey, I want to encourage uh, to, uh, some of the viewers, if you want to ask some questions, there's a chat box to your right. Um, if you want to ask Steph some questions, just put it in there and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, read that to Steph. Um, in the meantime, um, hey, are you, making, are you making statements with your work or is it, just, is it really just as carefree and fun and joyful as it looks? Are you, are you trying to tell us anything? You know, I think in in the art, uh, my idea is when you uh, ask an artist, what does it mean? Um, mostly when I'm painting, I'm not really thinking. It just comes out and I just try to express uh, feelings and, and uh, moments. And then I leave it to the others to become the critics and say whether they like it or not. Also, you see quite some paintings, but you there are also quite some paintings you don't see because I throw them away and I feel they are not uh, what I wanted to express. So I have a lot of time uh, 
and um, I work a lot, sometimes four, five, six hours a day. And sometimes I paint uh, very quick and uh, do a lot. And maybe half of it I overpaint or I don't like. So it's not really that I come up and say, hey, this is the mission, you know. It's more a bit, as uh, we call it in French, uh, uh, l'art pour l'art, you know, the art is for its own uh, reason, and not that I, uh, um, of course, I, I uh, have my ideas, but I do not express it necessarily as a rebellion artist or as a critical artist. I rather, um, you know, uh, just uh, do my job, you know, so to say. What's your daily routine? Do you are you do you exercise before you get up and paint? Do you meditate? Coffee? Yeah, I have uh, I have a bit uh, uh, I would say a privileged uh, life. I mostly go up like six o'clock in the morning because here uh, the mornings are very nice. I have uh, a horse, which uh, maybe twice uh, a week I go on uh, horseback. And uh, I just recently bought an, an, an electrical mountain bike. So we had now the beaches closed for almost two months in Costa Rica. So, and still closed? Yeah, uh, I mean closed for this uh, corona uh, crisis. That's why yeah. they closed it. And since uh, this week, it's opened up again. So mostly early in the morning, I do my one hour uh, biking to the beach and mountains. So that's how I start usually the day before uh, then having breakfast and then going to do uh, uh, maybe my work. So you try, do you try and get to the beach every day? Yes, that's, that's uh, uh, I think, at least once a day. I'm like, uh, let's say, two miles from the beach, so I see it even from my balcony and hear it at night. And either I go in the morning or I go down uh, for the sunset like uh, five o'clock. But this is like like a ritual I think I have to do uh, every day. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit uh about NOCA, uh, maybe you can tell us, let me bring that, bring that up on the screen here. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and, and how you're involved with NOCA. Well, um, at this moment, I have to say it's just... I met uh, uh, some of the, of the main players, like uh, Michelle, but uh, mainly also Jane uh, Nixon and also Emily uh, Gilaga and I think the the one that introduced me to this uh, art uh, community was uh, Jane Nixon. I owe her a lot. She really helped me also uh, quite a bit and uh, I feel they do really a, a wonderful job in, in uh, making uh, a bridge also between the local community and the let's call them expatriates that are Nosara is a bit a very unique place because it is uh, um, let's say there are quite a lot of foreigners uh, uh, living uh, uh, full time or as a second residence here. So I think they do also this cultural uh, uh, close this cultural gap but also do projects in recycling, education. And right now, uh, they uh, have just started two uh, days ago. I'm also a bit involved there. In uh, We are like four or five uh, artists, local artists, that donate uh, uh, works. I have donated like four works. And 100% of these um, sales go to this uh, Nozara Food Bank, which is also uh, it's a local uh, organization that 
uh, if uh, right now maybe 200 families a month uh, uh, food uh, uh, packages and also help, uh, you know, uh, um, a lot of people which are in extreme poverty right now for this, uh, you know, Nosara is um, it's a very touristic place. Maybe 70 to 80 percent of the people work in the tourist industry, which is right now completely dried out. There's no no work, no really uh, nothing to to be done. So some people really are in big troubles. And uh, this uh, food bank, they uh, they really uh, help there at least for the. Uh, for the worst uh, 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 problems, you know, so sure. that at least some people get their food on the table. Yeah, so this is the website here uh, where this au au art auction is happening. Um, so if you're interested in seeing more of Steph's work or purchasing, you can go there. And there's um, four or five other artists. Anyway, I'll mention it, including myself. <laughs> are, are exactly, on that exactly. I wanted just to mention it. <laughs> That you have three. I wasn't going to, but if someone goes there, they're like, why didn't he say something? Um, but um, anyway, yeah, I think they're doing, they're thinking of doing great work. And I, I think this particular project is pretty cool and, you know, super yeah. helpful. Absolutely. Um, anything else, anything else going on in terms of art sales? Um, are you in any galleries? I can't remember. Do you, are you in, in Nosara town at all? Or most people visit you at your home, right? You know, I have to say, right now it is uh, very quiet, but uh, the year started very good for me. I have um, uh, two or three, I call them art collectors. I have uh, 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 a German couple that uh, has bought uh, until now maybe 20 or more of my paintings. So they bought just another 10 in January. And I have some others that uh, just come visit me and uh, buy then directly from me. But uh, since January, also with this uh, COVID-19 uh, situation, uh, I mostly stayed home and really no one moves. So this art scene is, um, is also for the moment absolutely blocked. But... Uh, Yes, I, I have the intention, so if someone really uh, uh, knows a bit more, I would love to be presented in um, gallery also. Uh, I'm dreaming in having uh, some of my works maybe in, in, uh, in uh, Europe or even in, in New York, you know. So, but uh, uh, still, I have to work a bit to make this happen. You've, well, you've got art buyers that are living outside the country, right? People that, that visit you in Costa Rica and then take the prints home. Yes, uh, uh, but... Um, you're, talking, you're talking more about having a representation or a gallery in, in, in another country. Actually, these people you mentioned, maybe they come here, uh, they live uh, or as a tourist or as a resident, and then they take it back to Canada, to the U.S., and so on. But of course, uh, it would be uh, nice. I have now have uh, daughters that help me a bit with the website and uh, things like this. So I would uh, uh, like to get a little bit more organized that uh, online uh, sales could be a little bit uh, uh, more uh, uh, improved. And also, it would be helpful uh, to have some of my works somewhere outside Costa Rica, you know, for sale. Sure, <laughs> why not? <laughs> um, I'm just gonna show a, little, a few more pieces of your work here. Um, and again, if anyone has any questions for Steph, just put it in the, uh, the chat box to the right. Um, I just wanna show, I had a couple more pieces queued up here. Um, and you can stop me if there's anything you wanna talk about here but is this is this yeah. fairly, is this a recent piece or did i find an older piece here i think this uh was done uh late uh, last year and in fact it's uh, it's uh, an, a good example 
of uh, where you see this uh, this uh, basquiat uh, uh, playfulness uh, um, uh, in fact i did this uh, for um, my daughter uh, fabiana and arnau that's why i was writing their uh, this f a a r on top so that uh, they they just got married here in nozara uh, by the end of the year so that was uh, when i did this piece this is a wedding gift or was just in, to memorialize that the wedding it's a wedding gift but i brought them i was visiting them in in new york uh, and i brought them some of my larger paintings they have it on display in their uh um let's say a brooklyn apartment but um uh it's still here for them to take away whenever they want now when you transition to this basquiat feel um was that was that deliberate or did it just start happening like or do you wake up one day and say today i'm going to try something new like what does that transition look like yeah that's that's a good question kid um i think sometimes i'm getting a little bit fed up in doing these nice and beautiful women uh, things so uh when i'm a little bit in the mood in really uh, getting my hands a bit dirty a lot of these paintings even i do not even use a brush i do it with my fingers and uh, use uh, uh a lot of uh, different techniques so uh, mostly i work like with series so i cut the canvas in pieces and then i do maybe four uh, pieces they are uh, similar in its kind you know and uh, when it's done i frame them myself usually and put the stretches on and uh, do then two three days work in just getting them uh, ready to dry and and uh, to hang them on the wall you know to, to dry them completely sure um i noticed this cat character shows up often is that is he a, <laughs> yeah is that a uh, yeah my cat uh, uh, his name is uh, socrates it's a it's a companion i have all the time around i'm not so much a cat person but this cat just uh, just came to visit me and i started to to feed it and and still then uh, since then it's my let's say uh, the best companion so it is uh, then all the time mostly together with the horse also part of my world sure <clears throat> um hey I just we just got a comment from your friend jane um She's, uh, thank you for all you do for the food bank and for the local artists. Um, she's also she's also um, loves your new series, um, and she can't wait to get back to Nasara. <laughs> I guess I guess she got locked out when the borders closed. Ah uh, yes, uh, I also from my side I would uh, uh, like to express my thanks to Jane. She's maybe really one of those persons that helped me so much and. Um, uh really she made a big difference in in my uh uh work here and uh, i i thank her a lot and say she, sure. she, actually, to... she actually introduced us as well yeah hopefully hopefully she will be back soon when the situation uh, they say like july maybe the the border may uh, uh, open up again in in costa rica but we don't know exactly how this uh, this health situation uh, developed you know maybe they, maybe uh, mm -hmm. uh the boy i know the border was closed for a couple of reasons i mean one so people wouldn't move around but it was, was nicaragua a big piece of that they didn't want people because i i feel like nicaragua wasn't doing anything about the virus and the, and therefore they closed costa rica closed the borders to keep out keep the virus out yeah maybe if we if we touch this uh, subject i i could say the costa rican uh, uh, authorities especially also the health minister 
they did a fantastic job. If you see uh, other nations, they have like 10 victims, you know, uh, that uh, uh, amongst uh, 5 million people. And um, they really acted very quick. And uh, for uh, a lot of people, it's of course very uncomfortable, you know, with, with the traffic, with the, um, let's say also other restrictions they have, uh, they have started, but they are very successful. And as you mentioned, of course, uh, Costa Rica, it's not an island. And uh, we have here almost, we have no trains, we have almost no, no ships that uh, bring things in. So almost all the, the, the goods come in by container on the road. And uh, they come on the Pan American road from Mexico to Panama. But uh, as you mentioned, uh, Nicaragua has a, a, a catastrophic government uh, that do not care. I think the president first disappeared for almost two months during the worst crisis and then just uh, played it down that there is no uh, really need to do anything. So uh, Costa Rica uh, is, as you mentioned, worried. Uh, they had like, uh, I think two or three weeks ago, they made some border controls and they found like almost 50 uh, truck driver uh, positive uh, on this COVID-19. So they started to stop the complete uh, traffic. Yeah, I saw, I saw that there was a photo, I think it was on Instagram somewhere, where there was just 50 or 100 trucks just pulled over. Yeah, even, even a thousand, I think. It's, it's, a, it's a, in Nicaragua also, there are all the trucks from Honduras, from all around. And uh, I think it's a bit of a bad situation because um, on one side also, the goods that Costa Rica exports to Guatemala, all those places, they cannot uh, 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 go to their destination. So uh, it, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really a, a very uncomfortable situation. And one side to care for the citizen here, on the other side also have at least a bit of commercial movements uh, uh, um, possible, you know? So we don't know yet how this works out. And the other thing, as you mentioned, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, workers uh, here uh, in, uh, in in Costa Rica on construction sites and uh, all around. A lot of the work is, is done by uh, people from Nicaragua. And uh, they come and go, even sometimes not the official borders, they come what we call the green uh, border. And uh, right now we have hundreds of of people uh, with even drones and uh, to safeguard the borders because they are afraid of, I think they, they have arrested almost, uh, I don't know exactly the figure, but I have heard almost 10,000 people that wanted to come into Costa Rica on, on the green border. That's a huge problem, you know? Yeah, it's going to be tough to open those borders back up, knowing, you know, knowing what could be coming in with the... You know, I'm, I think... They may do it maybe a little bit like some European countries do, that they will allow maybe not all the nations to come in, you know. So uh, I think we have sometimes, uh, we had similar situation in, in Switzerland with Italy, you know. So uh, some, uh, uh, even some nations, they allow only some kind of nationalities to come in. I don't know what is uh, the, the solution, but I think uh, also one has to compromise a bit because uh, Costa Rica uh, has uh, not a strong economy. Uh, they had already big uh, financial problems before, and, and now it gets much worse. And tourism is maybe one of the top uh, let's say, um, sector in, in, uh, in the Costa Rican uh, industry. So uh, good advice is, uh, is really um, 
very expensive right now. I bet. Um, well, I, don't, <clears throat> I don't see any other questions here in the chat. Um, so I think I'll, I'll sign off and say thank you very much, Steph. It's always a pleasure to catch up with you. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to see you back soon. Uh, soon. Yeah. And uh, thanks a lot to be part of this, uh, you know, uh, event. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll come uh, as soon as I get back. We'll we'll have a, we'll share a beer. Come up, come up to your gallery or your Ooh. studio. All right. So thanks very much. Thank you. Take, take care. Be safe. Uh, okay. Bye bye. Thanks. Well, thank you all for tuning in. If you missed past episodes, you can binge watch <clears throat> on NCTV's YouTube channel, which is YouTube forward slash NCTV eighteen. Um, <clears throat> Our guest next week is one of my local heroes, photographer Daniel Sutherland of Nantucket. His work is simply stunning, and I uh, hope you can join us. A huge thank you to my friends at NCTV. Uh, without them, well, without the behind-the-scenes efforts, this show would not be possible. Um, and also a big thank you to my art advisor, Jane Nixon, who we mentioned earlier. Um, she's the one that makes me look like a, a little bit smarter about the art world. So thank you, Jane. Um, I will see you guys next week, and in the meantime, support your local art.